Today we have this really cool integral I picked up from Black Pen Red Pen's channel that looked like a nice variation or sort of variation of the Gaussian integral. And Black Pen Red Pen solved it using some cool elementary techniques, but when I saw the structure, I thought of a different solution development, which I thought was pretty cool as well. So here's how it goes. It starts off with the transformation from the x realm to the 1 by x realm, and that of course takes dx to the negative 1 by x squared dx realm. So i is now the integral from where to where. Well, as x approaches 0 from the right, we have 1 by x approaching infinity. So it's the integral from infinity to, as x approaches infinity, 1 by x will approach 0. And we have 1 by e to the negative x squared, so that gives us the familiar Gaussian term. And dx transforms into negative 1 by x squared dx. And of course we can get rid of the pesky negative sign by switching up the limits. So finally, we have the target integral i equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 minus e to the negative x squared by x squared dx. Now the transformed integral looks perfect for applying Feynman's trick of differentiating under the integral sign. So let's go ahead and define an integral function i of some parameter alpha as the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 minus e to the negative alpha x squared divided by x squared dx, where the target integral i is equal to the function, the integral function evaluated at alpha equal to 1. And we'll define the alpha parameter here to be greater than or equal to 0, as in it's non-negative. And that gives us a nice initial value for the integral function, because if I use alpha equal to 0, that would give me the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 minus e to the 0 being 1 divided by x squared, everything crashes out to 0. So i of 0 is 0, and that will come in handy later. So we have a nice plan in place, and we'll differentiate i with respect to the parameter alpha. And we'll switch up the order of the integration and differentiation signs, which is mathematically valid because the integral function converges. We know it converges by Dirichlet's test because we see in the numerator we have this 1 minus e to the negative alpha x squared term. So it's 1 minus a damped exponential function. So we know that's bounded. And this bounded function is being multiplied by 1 by x squared, which is a decreasing function on this interval. So by Dirichlet's test, we have a convergent integral, convergent integral function in this case anyway. So we switch up the order, and we now have the integral from 0 to infinity. And because of the switch up, we now have a partial derivative with respect to alpha of 1 minus e to the negative alpha x squared divided by x squared dx. So we're differentiating partially with respect to alpha, so the 1 by x squared term is a constant. The derivative of this one is, of course, 0. So we have a negative sign, e to the negative alpha x squared, and by the chain rule, we have a negative x squared term being multiplied as well. Some nice cancellation, and this implies that the derivative of i with respect to alpha equals the integral from 0 to infinity, of e to the negative alpha x squared dx, which is of course the Gaussian integral, which in this case evaluates to one half of root pi by alpha. Now I know what you're thinking and you're right, I should do a sort of retcon over here because of the way I define the alpha parameter initially. We should define the alpha parameter to be positive. So I just got rid of the equality over there now, what about the initial condition? Well, we're still interested in the zero case, but now with our modified way of writing alpha, we should deal with the limit as alpha approaches zero of i of alpha, and that, of course, still evaluates out to zero. So it's the limiting case that we're going to use as our information about the initial value conditions on the integral function. Okay, great. With that sorted out, I can return to my derivative. Everything looks mathematically valid now. 
and we can proceed with recovering back the integral function by integrating, of course. So we have the derivative of i equal to one half of root pi times the reciprocal of root alpha. And we integrate with respect to the alpha parameter. That gives me on the left hand side i of alpha. And on the right hand side, we have root pi by two times integrating. We get alpha to the one half, terribly sorry about that, divided by one half plus c. So we see that these terms cancel out and we're left with root pi times alpha plus the constant of integration c that we have to determine using our initial value conditions. And that was a limiting case. So applying the limit as alpha approaches zero to the whole thing, we have a zero equal to this limit also being zero plus c, implying that c conveniently equals zero. And we have i of alpha being root pi times alpha. Now, what exactly was the target case? Well, the target integral i was the integral function evaluated at alpha equal to one, which means that this integral is just root pi. And that's pretty cool. So we have another integral that evaluates to root pi, which makes this a close relative of the true Gaussian integral. And we might as well square everything just for the fun of it. And we have this equal to pi, another squared integral representation of pi. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.